Hello, welcome to the incident response station. This is news in place for investigations. Basically, if you don't record it, if you don't document it, it doesn't actually happen. This is going to be a real world approach to IR communications in all forms. All right. Now, in terms of where we are in the incident response lifecycle, this is primarily focused on preparation with a end goal of having what you need at the post-incident activities, and then a little bit of everything else in there. All right, now, mise in place, what does it even mean? Um, this is a culinary phrase, which um, basically summarizes getting all of the ingredients, getting all of your tools, getting everything that you need in order to make the dish done and right there so that you can just put it all together without having to go and pull out extra salt or more seasoning or another vegetable. Um, it's getting everything in place ahead of time. So that way the actual cooking portion goes as smoothly and as quickly as possible. Now, this is separate um, from what I would consider general project management and general restaurant management. So this is going to be focused on for the analyst, for you, what does it mean to get everything situated, get everything laid out ahead of time. So that way an investigation goes as smoothly and as efficiently as possible. All right, preparation hindsight. But before you can get everything set up, you actually have to know what you need to get set up. Um, what I recommend doing is go through what you normally use on a day-to-day -day basis, start adding a list, compiling it over time, and then kind of go review it. Uh, group it by incident type, group it by the different tools you kind of need and hey, if I do a phishing email, I'm going to use these four tools. So I'm going to make sure they're all grouped together. Um, I need to make sure that I have access to Active Directory. I need to make sure I have access to the email servers. Um, getting those checklists together will help you know what you actually need at the start of an incident. So that way you can just get going. All right, envisioning the end at the beginning. Now the goal is to get everything that you need to get that final dish complete and perfect but you have to know <laughs> what is required at the beginning. So you need to know what your requirements are. So what are the information you need for reporting? What is the information you need for lessons learned? Uh, what are auditors going to be going through and, and, and checking off that you included in each individual ticket or, or incident case? Um, do you already have templates? Do you have playbooks? Um, go through all of the documentation, go through all of the requirements that you already have access to, and then compile yourself what you need, what you need to focus on during an incident. Now, if none of this exists, well, <laughs> looks like an opportunity. Um, at least write them for yourself. I recommend sharing is carry. You know, make the documentation, share it with your team, but at the very minimum, make it for yourself. It is absolutely worth the time investment. Now, this the goal, what do you need as the incident is being worked? How do you need to prepare it? How do you need to format it? All of that kind of stuff is what you need to be thinking about before an incident is actually happening or the fire is you know, on fire. All right, some helpful tips and tricks. Clean as you go. We've all heard this taking the extra 20 seconds, a minute to write something down or clarify it in your own notes during the incident is worth the time. Um, it's difficult when everything's on fire to take that deep breath and go, hey, maybe I should add in a little tidbit here next to this IP address. Maybe I should write out what I think about this particular piece of log as I'm looking at it. Um, that saves you so much time. Like As it's fresh in your mind, write it down. Then personal pet peeve, if you have a abbreviation or non-standard, or honestly, any abbreviations, acronyms, explain them, <laughs> go through and write them out, at least at the beginning. Um, if you don't wanna put them in each individual ticket, make sure you have a little mini dictionary. So that way, when audit time comes around, QA time comes around, you can just give them a little cheat sheet to how you explain things and then be done. 
Um, the auditor prefers it that way, and I'm sure you prefer it that way. All right, now, biggest and most important thing, write your notes like you're going to get hit by a bus. <laughs> write your notes like you're going to get amnesia and you're not going to remember a single thing. Um, because I know I'm not alone in this. Um, sleep is like a little reset button. <laughs> you know, um, once you go to sleep and it's like, hey, I don't have this fresh in my head anymore. It's not all laid out in my head in this nice, cool, visual thing in the back of my mind. I've slept, I've moved on, I'm going on to the next hair on fire incident. Don't memorize what you can document. Uh, this is one of my favorite sayings because it's, you know, let the computers do the work. Um, there's search. Um, if you are someone who memorizes everything you get your hands on, power to you. Keep doing it. This is for, you know, the rest of us. All right. Looks like you're trying to do things the hard way. Can I help you out there? Short keys, speaking of abbreviations and acronyms, um, make hotkeys. Go through, hey, I type in, you know, IR. It's going to fill it out and write in incident response. Um, all of those things where you can keep as efficient as you want to keep, but the end result is still the nicer, fuller, human readable version. <laughs> Um, for short keys, there's tons of different options. I like auto hotkeys. Um, that's the first one that I came into and it's just kind of stayed with me. However, there are so many options out there. I mean, so many. Um, them, your own personal code. I know people who have their own personal Python code hotkey. It's crazy. Now, that gets into clipboard management. We do a ton of copy pasting. Um, it's kind of like when you see someone right click and hit copy and then go to the next page and then right click and click paste again. Nothing wrong with it. But we know control C, control V is just faster over time, especially if you're doing things 100 times, it's faster. Now, clipboard management is the next step in that. If you're not already doing that, I highly, highly recommend it um, because it's typically searchable on top of everything else. And then you can also store screenshots into it as well. The only thing here is you have to make sure you're setting up securely. You don't want to be the reason there's an incident. You don't want to be the one working the incident. So make sure it's secure. Make sure you get approval. Make sure it's handling all of your passwords and everything correctly. I do an auto clear. Um, that's what I prefer to do. I like using something like a password manager like KeePass. It actually goes into my clipboard manager and deletes out the passwords and usernames. Fantastic. Other types of PAMs and password managers might not necessarily do that, but get in there, figure it out, see what works best for you. Because again, there's no sure way to do anything here. The goal is to think about what you need during each incident and the tools that make you faster and better. Now, getting into actual instant response work, building a timeline framework. Um, and I specifically say framework here because no two timelines are the same. Um, no two tools handle the same way. Unfortunately, um, there's no two time zones um, or timestamps out there. Um, if you're one of those lucky people who already have a centralized logging tool and everything's already standardized, pat yourself on the back, go get grab a cup of coffee. This is not for you. Um, time zones, if you can't already insist as much as you can to stay with UTC. We've all run into problems, <laughs> those of us who've been there a few years with local time zone conflicts, things like ingest versus actual, all those types of things, knowing that your time is a actual source of truth and making sure it is one standard and you know what it is. That consistency saves you so much time and headache pun intended. Now, formatting. All right. It doesn't really matter if your org has a format that's preferred, use it. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. But other than that, pick something that works for you. Pick an IP, geolocation, usernames, host names, goes on and on and on and on and on. Pick a way that you want to format something and then stick with it. At least stick with it through the same incident. 
you can, you know, experiment and mess with stuff and see what works and what doesn't work, but don't change during an actual incident. Pick something you want to keep it through that one case and then, all right, that didn't work or that felt awkward. Let's try something else. Now, because <laughs> going through and cleaning this up at the end is such a headache. Um, we're not admins. If we wanted to do paperwork, we would have probably picked a different cleanup. Um, doing this as you go, cleaning as you go, will make that final report, those final ticket summaries, almost painless. Can't promise completely painless, but as, as, close, as, as close as it can be. Now, your timeline, specifically your timeline, not necessarily your whole ticket, but your timeline has two main audiences. So typically you're gonna have two types of timelines. One is kind of for yourself because the audience is a peer. Um, it's your security manager, it's your senior analyst. Um, this is your log data, your detailed information, CSV files, case attachments. Um, they're gonna, they want, they want the meat. Um, everyone else, your managers um, or non-technical managers, I should say, stakeholders, executives, they want the layman's terms. <laughs> they wanna know what happened when, but in a very general sense. Um, so this is more of a timestamp, single line of data, what happened here, then this happened, so on and so forth. That way they can kind of get an idea of what happened without having to figure out microseconds because that's never fun. All right, I've said this before, but I'm gonna say it again. Let the computers do the work. That's why we created them. That's why we love them. If you can think of any, there's gonna be an IR, an actual DFIR tool that does the work. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole giant list of different tools that do timeline work based on events, based on different types of logs, CSVs, all kinds of cool stuff. There's a ton out there. Bug our forensic teams about them, and they'll be more than happy to give you some pointers and some recommended ones. Now, for the incident handling side of things, we're going to be talking more around that previous slide layman's term timeline. So you're trying to get a general sense of what's going on as you're doing it. So this is kind of for you. So you can kind of keep that timeline in your head as you're going through and scoping, as you're going through and doing that analytics work. Hey, did this happen before this or after this? Do I have the right timestamps? Make sure which one happened when. Now, there's nothing wrong with plain text markdown. It, it works. Um, can't really sort filter, but it works. Um, if that's something you want to do, it's going to be a little bit slower, but again, it just works. Um, Excel has its place, but we all know Excel and time are, you know, they're friends, but they're not really close. You know, they, they misinterpret each other entirely too often. <laughs> but if you can get it to work, it will work for you. Um, there's some more fancy things like Jupyter Notebooks and something like Me Too, which is kind of like an embedded Excel spreadsheet into Jupyter Notebooks super cool if you're into that kind of templating then living off the land is what you got um, if you have a central logging tool or security software that does this type of work figure out what's there and utilize it so things like the timeline in microsoft defender it got this cool new feature where you could flag individual events super neat super hyped it's something i've been wanting for a while <laughs> um, having a local instance of slug that you can just dump the relevant files in and logs as you go and it'll just build it for you um, the same thing with local version of kibana um, archimy has some really cool filtering um, there's some ways to do custom tables and all kinds of fun stuff once you get into it but figure out what you got and use it all right now it's time to take a look at what it actually looks like when we put a timeline in place based on our kill chain all right, and here we go. Now, the incident premise for Kill Chain 1 is a kickoff from a potential phishing issue. Now, we've already had our forensic team go in and pull all the information and then provide that to us. So we're actually working from a already existing technical timeline and forensic analysis that's already been completed. Our forensics team in Project Obsidian has done an absolutely amazing job, and so this makes this a whole lot simpler. And that's what we're focusing on, simplicity. 
Now in my incident case template here, um, I'm going to the timeline outline section, and I'm actually just going to include the markdown from our forensic team of the technical timeline that has already been done. Now you can see here, this is what they've completed already. We see our lovely UTC. We see very clear language in terms of what I would expect to see between two teams being shared. And then we're going to keep going. We see, you know, initial access all the way through persistence, some lateral movements, and even, you know, coming in and getting some yummy password files. All right, now on the executive timeline, we're going to frame this a little bit differently. We're going to make sure we tell them up front what time zone we're in. Um, in Magnetism, Magnum Tempest Financial, um, they are based in San Diego, so we selected Pacific time here. And we're also going to want to lay out the scope up front. Um, now that this isn't, didn't happen over multiple days, this happened over a fairly narrow time frame. Now, I went and I converted those UTC timestamps to a readable format in terms of ease of knowing what it is in terms of context. Um, I broke out the activity section into two, uh, one being a little bit more of a summary of the activity and the other one being the more details based off of that activity. Um, you also notice that I took off, I don't know if I didn't take all of them, I took off most <laughs> of the seconds. And that is because we didn't actually have anything fall within the exact same minute. So in ease of reading, there was no need to include the seconds as extraneous information because every single line of activity in terms of this timeline did happen in a different minute. If I had any duplications, I would have actually kept all of the seconds because then you have that consistency through the timeline. But since each one happened in a different minute, we can go ahead and cut those out, make things a little bit cleaner. I make sure that the format all looks pretty consistent. So all of the file paths are in quotes with a little bit of extra information at the end. And use the same summary type wording in each section. And you see that there was an unknown timestamp. And I put a caveat here. Um, I can Based on my experience, I can look at this data analysis and know when this when this occurred. Not you know 100% granted, but pretty dang close. Um, this is where, in the timeline, I would presume this activity occurred. So I put it there. I make a little caveat and I put my little notes saying, "Hey, I didn't have an exact time frame, but based on my experience, this is where this was, and this is why I think so." And that is about it. Let's get back to the presentation. All right, now, gone through timeline, we kind of get some tips and tricks. So what do good notes look like? All right, it's, it's receipts, it's, it's COIA, it's making sure that you know what you know. All right, good notes, everybody sleeps better at night. You sleep better at night, your legal team sleeps better at night, your manager, your CISO, your C-suite, everybody just, is calmer and more chill when they know that they can open up an incident and actually understand what's going on. Um, I like asking myself these questions. If I'm being grilled by me, can I answer my questions? And sometimes the answer is no. And I need to be like, okay, I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to make sure that I'm writing these notes out because I want to know the answers to these questions two months from now when I'm going back and looking through these for whatever reason. And then on top of that, why are you even asking? Why are you even being asked these questions? Um, why would this come up? And if you can figure out that root cause why, then you can incorporate that as you go, as you're building out your notes, as you're working your investigation, and it really, really helps. Um, now, during that investigation, typically you need to pinpoint the root cause. Um, sometimes that's an estimation. Sometimes that's just hey, this is as far back as we got, this is as much information as the data allows, then what data points um, are you going to actually need to 
do something about it. Like, are you going to talk tune? Are you going to rescope? Hey, you know what? I searched the sender for a phishing email and they just send this one spearfish. They sent all these spearfishes, all different kinds of URLs, all different source IP addresses. All right, we're going to have to do some phishing ourselves. Cast a big net, pull out all those data points, and that's information that we will then use to rescope the investigation as it's being worked. That's the information you're going to take and you know, bundle up in a nice, here's some opportunity for tuning. Hey, why did this happen? What could we do to prevent it? But we can't even do that if we don't have that data. And then finally, lessons learned. Um, it's kind of nice, nice as you're going through the investigation to be like, hey, you know what? I really wish we had a way that someone could just press a button and it just reports the email as phishing. Because then that first person who just deleted it would have been able to just hit that button. And then no one else would have gotten fished. It would have been amazing. Now, writing that out as you're going through your lesson, as you're going through the investigation, it doesn't have to be a lot. It can just be, hey, I see a user touch this email before anyone else. We could have stopped it further upstream by putting some tools in the hands of our users. That's a way to lessons learned. You don't have to go in crazy detail. It can just be a simple note to self so that when you are, when you are going back through your investigation notes, you can have that little ding of a light bulb and go, oh, yeah, let's see what that entails and actually flesh out the lessons learned and the potential solutions to help you not have to do all of this work again. Now, basic core for good notes. If they can't explain why you did a thing, you need to include it. You need your reasoning and your proof. If you purge an email, why did you do it? Um, hey, it's a fish. Okay, well, right. I closed the ticket. All right, well, why did you close the ticket? Oh, spam not phishing. Hmm? Can you tell me why? Tell me why you think that this is what it is. It doesn't have to be a lot. It doesn't have to be going deep, deep, deep into the weeds, um, but it does have to have enough so that way, again, you can answer these questions. All right. Because <laughs> notes are for your protection. Um, I mentioned that this is CYA before. If something is missed or you make a mistake or your train of thought just completely misses a loop, which happens, it is perfectly normal in sock land, someone else should be able to read through your notes and read through your tickets and go, oh, yeah, they just didn't know, they weren't aware of this. So this is something lessons learned for the investigation. We'll give them that training. Will, hey, make sure you check this next time and it won't happen again. But you're not going to get, no one's going to be upset with you. No one's going to be cranky or, or at all. They're just going to go, oh, hey, yeah, um, I see exactly what you did. Just next time when you get to this stage, you know, make sure you include this. That's it. And you're like, oh, cool. Learn something. You know that I'm not going to do this again. Everybody's happy. And then bringing up audits again, if you're having to pull from memory to answer questions or go through your lovely, lovely rough saved plain text notes, we all have them, notes of shame, it, you're not going to have a good time. It's going to take a long time. The auditor is going to be mad, fat and sad, schmad and miserable. You're going to be sad and miserable. It's just not a good time. Make sure your notes are there and thorough so that way you're not having to stop doing incident work to go and talk to an auditor about an incident that happened six months ago. Your notes are your save button because as you're going through the notes, especially those of us who work, you know, with very weird hours or have multiple shifts or people who have weird off days or that lovely 24 7, 365, you got fun split shifts. Um, your notes are your save button. If you are compiling all of this locally, and you're not adding in comments to your ticket or into the actual incident case, and something happens and you know an emergency pops up and you're gonna have to go deal with your kid, talk or anything that could possibly happen, uh, someone else is gonna have to go and reinvent the wheel and go through from the last thing that happened that you actually notated and power through it themselves. Um, if you are saving as you go, um, sometimes they even set a timer on it. It's like, hey, 
every 10 minutes I need to go and write a quick blip on what's going on. Um, different time frames for different severity. You can get pretty fun with it. But the biggest thing is note it as it happens. Because if you are, like this example says, six hours into incident response, and you are trying to remember, why did I add this IP address? And it's fifth, and you've been going through hundreds of them. It's 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 not going to be a good time. You're going to have to go back and try and retrace your own steps to figure it out, and it's going to take a lot more time that you could be doing spending, not doing this. All right, now it is time for our next demo. All right, here is demo number two. This is the same kill chain, same premise. We are just going to go through the analysis reports and cover a little bit of the details on why the decisions were made that they made and why the information is formatted the way it is. Um, here we are. Now we have a full workstation analysis here. Now this is what is, hey, I see a, I have a known indicator. I'm now going to go through this particular device with a fine tooth comb and find anything related to that or anything that stands out as suspicious or suspect. We have a one piece of many forensic analysis. So this is one of six, I believe, forensic analysis. And these all get pieced together because to be one greater analysis on the whole kill chain including all of the persistence and the multiple segues to different hosts and different user accounts. And then we have a quote unquote, it's just a blank template. This is where I put case notes. This isn't the actual analysis, but this is where I would be putting information as I'm actively running the investigation, as I'm getting asked questions, as I'm completing status updates, as I'm running queries, I'm going to be putting it in some place that I know where each point is and where it's organized and easy to access. Like Duke Notebook because of the modularity of it, I would say. Um, but there's tons and tons of different options out there. Um, I think the most that you see from Project Obsidian is going to be a lot of Markdown. <laughs> and I use Markdown too, just in Jupyter Notebook alongside code as well. Well, let's go back to the analysis and here we are. So for this, when you're just going through and this is basically a single workstation analysis, you're going to have the timeline events based on that one host and then the conclusion on that host and any findings that got discovered through it. And so we see all of that in here. Oh, I'm not going to scroll. That's, that's a lot. That's a whole lot. Um, but it includes things like this, like the Cyber Chef, Cyber Chef recipe to use in order to do the code that. That's something that I grab as well. Any query, anything that you do to transform data, you want to make sure you put a record of that because, again, it'll be six months later and they'll be like, hey, yeah, I saw you did this. And how did you get from point A to point B? And you're just like, oh, I, I have slept since then. I do not remember. And that is why we write things down. Um, we write things down so that way, if our memories fail us, we have evidence and proof and records of what we did at that particular time. Then this last analysis, this is a really good format. I like this one a whole lot. Um, this one establishes the scope of the analysis first. Um, so the baseline of what you're trying to do, the scope of the host and user then pulls all the other users associated with it. Timeline that we're looking at, the artifact that triggered this analysis in the first place. And then, hey, yeah, what did I actually search on this? I pulled the logs. I looked in the Windows event logs. I went and looked at the Windows system services as well. And I pulled memory forensics. So in terms of what happened here, I know all the places that I checked. I know anything that I found that was related to this, as well as my initial assessment or even my final assessment of what I believe that to be in relation to the greater incident. So in this particular case, this workstation six, yeah, he got 
an email. He forwarded that along to have someone else do some analysis on the email. He didn't actually open it or download it or trigger anything suspicious on his actual device. However, he did find something interesting. Through this process, it's discovered this user has a plain text passwords.txt file. So things that pop out at you while you're going through, you know, created or recently updated files, which is believe what this triggered and got this into uh, the eye of our forensic forensic analyst here, um, which is this this password file. This is not something you want to see on somebody's on somebody's desktop, um, especially being recently updated, especially being in upper level titles. This particular user is in leadership and also is in IT leadership. So the likelihood of there's something being you know, very sensitive in this file is high. So this is something you want to kind of either make a note of and then come back to later. Or, you know, if you have the time during the incident, you've already put out all the other fires, bio, fires, um, go in, take a look, just like this, pull the source, pull the extra information. That way, when you're doing the report, this can be added on as a part of the lessons learned or part of the, um, points of interest or solutions, recommendations provided to the client or to the leadership. All right, and that is about that. Let's get back. Right. Color commentary and play-by-play. -play. Now, are you sick of my analogies yet? <laughs> I love them. It's a way to translate what's happening in my brain to other people. I try to use them. I love this analogy. This is one of my favorite ones. I feel like this is one of the things that sports does really well. I love lovely sports bay, sports ball, go team, hit the ball, score a goal, things. <laughs> There's usually two announcers. You're watching a game on TV or you're listening to it on the radio. You're going to typically hear two voices for every game there is. Um, sometimes there's more. There's always at least two. Now, one of them is considered the play by play announcer. They are describing it as it happens. If you are not watching the TV, if you're just listening to it, you can actually follow along with them and know what's happening at any one point in time. It's that simple. They are just describing it as it happens, literally what it, what's happening. Now, your other person is our color commentary. Color commentary. I can speak. All right. They're going to provide additional information around the players and the actions. They're going to be doing things like, hey, what is that coaching decision? What, what's the context around the actions that are actually happening? Um, this person missed a goal, but he had an injury. Um, all those types of things where you're adding um, additional depth to the actual literal things that are happening as it happens. Now, the reason why they do too, is because it works. It's a really effective combination where you have your facts laid out, right alongside someone giving you more detail and more personal opinion, or most of the time, expert opinion, call it that. And then you kind of get what you need out of it. Um, you can be both, you know, a newcomer to the game, as well as, you know, a super, super intense fan, and understand what's happening, and get as much or as little from this type of commentary as it's actually happening. It's, it's pretty effective and there's a reason why it's super, super common. Now, oh, now we apply that to notes. <laughs> you're going to have your color commentary and you're going to have your play by play. Your color commentary, typically, you're going to want to restrict this to just your team. Um, you're not going to want to have this visible outside of your security team or your SOC team or SOC department, depends on what it is. Do you know your group best? Make sure it is a internal discussion, but it is important to have it because that color commentary is how we can talk to these different ideas and understand the depth and, oh, okay, this is, this is the why behind this, but it's kind of, we're only like 80% sure. So we're not gonna like bring this out to the whole public. We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna keep this internally. But it's important for especially newer members or people who aren't um, doing incidents as frequently to have that extra information because that way they can learn from 
everyone else's work. It's really, really important. Um, again, be professional. This isn't color doesn't mean color in terms of you know colorful language, um, but it, it, you include your honest professional opinion. Um, some tools out there include gifts and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, but the idea is that you're adding depth to the facts, background, interesting pieces of information. All right, enough on that. Then we get into play by play. I want the facts and just the facts. Um, you're going to need neutral tone. We do not want any extra drama. We don't want someone panicking about, you know, some intel tidbit that you included in it. This is literally, this is the order of events. This is the order of operations of what happened. Here we are now. The different types of this typically are status updates, shift reports, um, pause summaries, and client updates. Now, to, you're not always going to be doing this depending on your role, but these are the three most common types of external facing communiques. Now, be very, very, very careful um, that you know who sees what. Um, make sure we, you test it. Make sure you know that there's two different types of ticket votes. One is internal, one is external. Always double check before you post stuff in because you want to make sure the lines are clean and the people who get the information are getting the exact information that they need and nothing more. All right, speaking of, we're all Vulcans here. All right, outward facing notes, no opinions, only facts. We know that something's a breach. We know that something's a compromise. We can tell that someone from Russia logged into this user account. But we have to say that in a correct or proper wording. Otherwise, a good old legal team, not gonna be too pleased with you. <laughs> so unless it is literally your job to make that decision and use the actual words, just don't do it. Um, use some prefixes. I've got some lovely P's down below. Possible, potential, popped. Um, these are all fun things that some of you might have seen and not understand quite why someone is using this, why someone's qualifying um, the term compromise or breach. And that's because this type of soft wording describes what's happening. So you understand what, what the thing is, but you're not using a word that actually has a regulatory or legal meaning. The term breach, the term incident, those actually have meanings that can start SLA timers and <laughs> compliance timers. And you don't want to be the one accidentally starting that timer and having everyone else rush to go complete in order to get it done in time. So that way the org is not facing fines or more audits or whatever the case may be. So things like security event, unauthorized access. We don't, we don't use the term incident. You don't use the term breach. You don't use the term compromise, not without saying possible or potential, things like that. Um, yes, it's kind of silly. Yes, it seems silly. <laughs> but if you go through it and you get used to it, it makes everyone happy. You add an extra word in, the legal's happy because they can have a greater degree of control over when those timers start and when they have to deal with regulatory agencies and legal contractual obligations. All right, now time for our last demo. All right, last but not least, here's demo number three. We're just going to continue our look through those same um, analysis files. We're going to talk about it a different way. We're going to explain why they framed things the way they did and the word choices, things like that. All right, now let's get back to where we were on Workstation 6 analysis. Now, the framing of this, like I mentioned, this is really nice, but the reason why is to be like, hey, what, what, this is what I'm trying to do. I am trying to review it and identify indicators specifically for the compromise. And then we're going to, at first, this is a baseline. I, I really love this. Like, I think this is really good because you're setting your expectations up front. You're like, hey, when you're reading through this, this is what I am attempting to do through this document. Um, it's very, very important. It's the reason why they've got the TLDRs at the tops of things, why you have summaries, um, because it really helps set the tone for the rest of the document or the rest of whatever it is that you're trying to do. Now, he 
clearly again states the scope um and then this is a little bit of color here so yes here's this um it's important to review the users so this we know that this is the user and this is the workstation that we care about but we are going to pull the users associated with this time frame that we're aware of and this particular host and make sure that we're you know covering all our bases we have a good timeline i like the wording on this because this is very um I have to say, I have to say warm. Um, it's, a, it's a way of summarizing the event without making it a little bit too clinical. Instead of being like, log on, Kara Moons, this is what they did. Here we are. Um, the making things into sentences really helps people picture things in their heads. Um, and that's what we're trying to do here. Um, for a timeline, especially a kind of a summary timeline like this one is, um, if you want to be able to read through it and kind of have a picture of your in your head of the point A to point B to point C and be able to have that visualization, which is really important. So like emails, hey, what not to do. Um, these are summaries and all of this information, like we have those email comms, we have those logs and those are available to us. But this is that nice summary. Then we go through each artifact and the properties of those. Um, there's really nothing much to do in terms of color. This is facts, like this is the thing. <laughs> um, but when we get into log review, this is when we are doing some interpretation. So, hey, we looked up the Windows event logs. Those are in security. We see something odd, but it's not that odd. And it's not, we can't link it to the rest of the kill chain. So here's the fact. And the assessment of that fact is, yeah, it's, it's not good, <laughs> but it's not necessarily malicious. And this nothing substantial um, makes makes that makes it exactly right. Here we guess this is unusual enough to where I'm going to include this in my analysis, but I make sure that yes, I don't see that this is related to the greater kill chain events because that's the goal, right? Because that's what we're trying to focus on. And it continues the same same thing on the new systems. Hey, yeah, uh, I'm seeing Defender is running. The assessment is unlikely malware is on there. Memory forensics. I went through all the memory. I didn't see anything suspicious. Um, this miscellaneous concern. Great wording, by the way. Um, it's not necessarily a security incident itself. Um, but this is definitely something we'd want to include in our notes. And probably maybe like ask your manager, like, hey, you know, while I was going through this. Uh, I saw that Brad has a um, plain text password file on his desktop. Just was right there. Couldn't could not see it. Um, can you mention something or like, starting that conversation? So that way, things that could be a potential risk to the organization, like a plain text file or an IT manager or director, I believe, you're going to want to get that addressed. Um, because while we enjoy investigations, um, we also like sleep. So got to gotta balance those. <laughs> got to balance those two things out. All right, let's get back to it. And it's all at once. This is the TLDR of everything that I just went over. Preparations and lessons learned are not just for the organization as a whole. Um, an individual analyst can get just as much out of those, if not more, and it will help your work quality. And honestly, it'll just make you less stressed. It'll make you more confident and you'll feel better overall handling tickets and handling incidents when they happen, because you'll be prepared. You'll feel like you actually somewhat know what you're doing when everything's on fire. It's great. Um, these needs in place kind of self checklists can help you identify all of the stuff you need ahead of time. So that way you can address those gaps before they become blockers during an actual incident. And then UTC is best time, always. Best girl UTC, the best. Write what you do and as you, and you think as you do it and think it. Um, you wanna stream of consciousness, your notes, and then tidy them up a little bit, put them in your ticket and smash that save button. That's going to keep everything 
all nice and tight. And then if you need to actually hand off an incident, you're not spending an hour trying to summarize your notes or go through everything and hand it off to the next person. It's already there. You're like, oh yeah, no, let me just finish this last little segment and hop that in. Now, of course, be nice to your legal team and they will be nice back. I promise they're not scary. They're super chill people. They just have an entirely different set of, now ah, what's the term? Obligations, there we are. Obligations then what we are focused on. And if we can make them happy, they will then have our backs, our back when the time comes. And it's very handy, I assure you. Okay, references. Well, we had the one from News and Place from Wikipedia. And we're done. I want to thank you for listening to my recording on note taking. I'm impressed that you made it this far. It's kind of a boring topic. It's kind of everywhere though, and I feel like it's super, super important. So I want to thank you again. And if you want to join the conversation or you have feedback or strong opinions, go ahead, hop into Discord, let us know. Thank you again.